Hello, welcome to another Open Philosophy video. In this video, we will be continuing our discussion of mind. In particular, we will be considering the question of whether the mind is just complex physics. This idea is known as reductionism. We have seen previously that philosophical naturalists look to neuroscience to give us a complete description of the mind. Neuroscience, of course, sees the brain as a data processing system. Its inputs are sensations, its outputs are motor impulses, and the brain states encode contents or information. While all of this is perfectly true, it misses a great deal. It misses intentionality, which is revealed to us by introspection of our states. It misses our awareness, our ability to will, and our ability to think as opposed to processing data. Consequently, I have proposed a two-subsystem model as more adequate to our experience. Despite their inability to construct an adequate model, naturalists continue to believe that the brain is the only subsystem in the mind. Why is this? There are two basic arguments for the mind being purely physical. One is that all the neurons in our brains are controlled by the laws of nature, and the neurons control our speech, our behavior, and everything else that we do or will. So that leaves no room for our intentions to control anything. The idea is that the laws of nature are universal, and if they're universal, they control all matter. The second line of argument is more philosophical and is due to Jaeguan Kim. Kim defends what he calls the principle of causal closure. He writes, If you pick any physical event and trace out its causal ancestry or posterity, that will never take you outside the physical domain. That is, no causal chain will ever cross the boundary between the physical and the non-physical. We can dispose of Kim's argument in short order because he simply doesn't understand how the laws of nature work. Kim is caught up in the idea of Humean Kantian causality. That is to say, he thinks that prior events cause later events. Of course, prior events are not present when later events happen, and so they're just not there to do anything. What really causes events is the laws of nature. The laws of nature are concurrent. That is to say, that if energy is being conserved now, the law of conservation of energy has got to be operating now. If it's not operating now, then energy is not conserved now. So the whole idea of tracing things backward and forward in time, looking at the posterity and the ancestors of this current event that is being considered, that idea is a kind of a foolish idea. It misunderstands how causality actually works. In video 15, we looked at the line of causality which kept a stone in existence. We saw that it was kept in existence by the laws of nature, which acted concurrently, and that the laws of nature themselves needed an explanation because the laws of nature are a phenomenon and science requires that they have an explanation, which we saw were meta-laws, and following that chain of explanation up we found that we eventually had to come to some stopping point in order to have an explanation at all, and that stopping point was God. So looking at the scientific chain of explanation behind events, we do go outside of the physical to the non-physical and eventually come to God. Thus, the principle of causal closure is simply due to a misunderstanding of how the laws of nature work. Now let's look at the other argument, the argument that since physics applies to everything in nature, there's no room for intentions to do anything. First of all, as we've seen previously, physics does not apply to everything. Knowledge results from an interaction between knowing subjects and a known object. In doing natural science, we don't care about the knowing subjects, we care about the objects in nature. As a result, we fix on them and abstract away both the experiential interactions and the knowing subjects. As a result, we have objective, observer-independent data on the objects of our interest, namely the objects in nature. 
However, when we turn to the mind, which is the core of human subjectivity, we have no data because our method has been specifically designed to filter out subjective data. One thing that is often forgotten about physics is that it is the most abstract of all the natural sciences. When I say abstract, I mean that it forgets about the context in which things occur. For example, it doesn't care if an electron is in a piece of metal or in a human being. Once we've abstracted away the context, the data in the context is no longer available. When someone thinks that all the information in the world is implicit in physics, they are forgetting that the context abstracted away by physics is the majority of everything that human beings know. As a concrete example, consider the tsunami that recently devastated a good part of Japan. The reality we saw is both complex and heartrending. But tsunamis, as modeled by physics, are neither complex nor heartrending. Even the most complex models of applied physics are a far cry from the reality. The point is that once data has been abstracted away, it's no longer in the data set. All the data on the context, all the data on the complexities and interactions is gone. So a theory built on the abstract data set is going to explain the abstraction. It's not going to explain the data that is no longer there. We can hope that it will explain the data that is no longer there, but that is merely a hope. What we need to do is test the range of application of our theories. When we do that, we find that they're limited. Newtonian mechanics was limited because it didn't apply at the quantum level. It didn't apply for relativistic energies and speeds. It didn't apply for very strong gravitational fields, and so on. Yet in the 19th century, physicists were convinced that Newtonian physics would explain the entire world and that we only needed to clean up the details. The same is true with naturalists today. They assume that our current physics will explain everything that needs to be explained and we only need to clean up the details. Historically, this has never turned out to be the case. The problem is what Whitehead calls the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Misplaced concreteness is taking our abstractions and treating them as though they were the reality. That's what naturalists do. They take the abstractions of mathematical physics and treat them as though they are the full reality that we see in our everyday experience. There is no reason to believe that this is so. Just as experiments showed that Newtonian physics was limited when it came to the quantum level or the relativistic level, so experiments are beginning to show, as I discussed in the last video, that intentions modify the laws of nature. This is another empirical limit which is being run into by physics. It is no different in kind than the idea that Newtonian physics is limited in application when it comes to the quantum realm or the relativistic realm. Now it is also limited when it comes to the intentional realm. Next time we will be continuing our discussion of the mind by considering the question of whether computers think or alternately, whether the brain is just a computer. Thank you for your time and attention. Please leave comments and questions.